Uh, thanks, Greg. Uh, yeah, look, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to participate in the webinar today. And I'd like to um, acknowledge the ongoing great support we've got from DAF for our grazing management initiatives in southeast Queensland. So today, um, I'll most likely be going over some uh, key grazing land management principles you might already be familiar with. But I guess it's, it's some of those key strategies and actions that are critical for ensuring your land is resilient and that your pasture recovers from disturbances. So unfortunately, there's no quick fixes or silver bullets. So to make a start, so climate aside, um, the long-term productivity and resilience of our land and our enterprises is really driven by two key factors, and that's the productive capacity of our land, particularly its soils and pastures, and how we manage that land. Um, good grazing land management is about managing the pastures and the number and type and location of animals on your property to optimise pasture growth and composition. Um, it needs to consider the property as a whole, uh, with a view to reducing um, threats from land degradation, pests and weeds. Again, improving resilience to disturbance, so following drought, flood, unplanned wildfires, and safeguarding and enhancing biodiversity on the property. So all that basically starts with an understanding of your land, its capabilities, uh, limitations and condition, and having a plan to manage that. So let's start with some land types. So land types are unique uh, parcels of land distinguished by uh, associated landform, soil and vegetation types. So DPI or DAF have developed over 230 land type descriptions across 16 regions in Queensland. And that's based on a lot of previous land resource assessment information, extensive research and field work. They're pretty extensive in their descriptions of landform, vegetation communities, expected pasture composition, soil types, uh, there's a lot of land use recommendations and they've basically been developed to help landholders identify areas at the paddock and property scale that differ in their capability and limitations and provide practical information on how to manage them. So let's look at a few common land types you might be familiar with. So here's our fertile blue gum on alluvial flats, you know, typically our clay and clay loam soils. Uh, iron barks on, on granite soils, so, so typically lighter soils with a higher uh, sandy sandy loams or sandy soils, uh, iron barks on duplexes and loams. So duplexes just refers to those texture contrast soils where we might have a, a loam or a sandy loam over a heavier clay. Uh, our, our spotted gum and iron bark ridgy country, um, usually limited by by depth of soil and perhaps rockiness and slope, and our fertile um, softwood scrub type country. So I guess uh, the key point to remember, yeah, and this graph highlights, is the significant difference in pasture production for a range of land types in southeast Queensland at a given location that receives about 800 mils of annual rainfall on average. So really note the differences between our more, more fertile scrub country at about six and a half thousand kilos of dry matter per hectare per year, and those fertile uh, alluvial or basalt derived clay soils at about 5,000 kilos per hectare of dry matter per year compared to our forest country on our ridges or on those duplexes and loams, which might only grow uh, up, up to about 3,000 uh, kilos of, of dry matter per year. So I guess the key message is that land types aren't the same. The old adage, soils ain't soils, and they must be managed accordingly. So good grazing land management involves understanding the mix of land types on your, on your property and the potential pasture uh, production uh, ca capacities that influence your decisions in terms of the long-term safe carrying capacity, uh, utilisation rates, and where you might place infrastructure, fencing, water points to ensure evenness of grazing across your property. So uh, largely that capacity to produce useful pasture is governed by the soil and its water holding capacity and ability to store and provide nutrients to plants. So let's look at, look at some, some key soil health functions and properties. So a healthy soil is one that's been described as having balanced interactions between its physical, chemical and biological properties that promote the health of plants, animals and humans, while maintaining some of those broader ecosystem services such as landscape stability. It's a key engineering medium and a, uh, an, and a medium for regulating, storing uh, water, nutrient and gases. So uh, a healthy soil is one that's productive and easy to manage under appropriate land use. It's about it being fitness for purpose 
within its inherent land use limitations. So let's look at a couple of key functions that the soil has. Um, and the first one is about uh, getting water into the soil and being able to store it so it's available to plants and microbes. One of those key measures is the plant available water content of our soils. So the key, um, some of the determinants there is actually the soil texture. So that mix of sand, lime and clay particles and also the soil organic matter content of your, uh, of your soils and structure, which again is influenced by our grazing management. So you can see there in the graph on the left hand side that while our, our well structured clays might have the highest storage capacity, it's actually our loamy soils that have the highest plant available water capacity due to their mix of pore sizes, uh, having more plant uh, water available to the plants in those particular soils. Here uh, is about nutrient availability and, and recognising that all of our plants, our pasture plants, need a steady supply of both macro and micro nutrients for healthy growth and functioning. Uh, and pastures are largely influenced by the levels of nitrogen, phosphorus, and cation exchange capacity levels in our soil. So, with cation exchange capacity being a measure of the soil's ability to hold uh, nutrients, and it's influenced by the, the clay type and clay content and also the soil organic matter. Uh, which leads on to the next slide. So soil organic matter is a key driver of our system uh, and, and soil health. It supplies nutrients for plants. It helps bind aggregates and improve soil structure, helps infiltration and water storage, uh, provides food uh, and habitat for soil microbes and macroorganism, and ensure, uh, insulates plant roots and buffers pH. It's uh, typically measured as soil organic carbon uh, and the ways we can uh, in, increase and maintain our soil organic carbon is again by growing diverse uh, perennial pastures and maximising our ground cover levels. That leads on to the next slide about ground cover and how ground cover plays a really important role in maintaining our healthy ecosystems from the, from the ground up. Uh, ground cover protects the soil from the harmful effects of sun, wind and rain um, strictly speaking, it's anything that breaks the fall of rainfall up to 30 centimetres above the ground. So when we're looking at, at ground cover levels, that includes uh, actively growing pasture plants, leaf litter, dung, uh, biological soil crusts, sticks and rocks. Again, uh, it acts to maximise infiltration and minimise uh, erosion and runoff. Uh, it again insulates the soil surface from drying winds and evaporation to retain moisture and maximise microbial activity. Uh, really important uh, to help uh, minimise invasion of uh, undesirable or annual plants or weeds, uh, provides a great food source from soil microbes and things under the ground, and also provides key habitat for uh, a variety of ground dwelling fauna above the ground. So the next slide highlights a, uh, a, a, the results of a runoff trial that was conducted at Mount Mort down here in southeast Queensland, which measured runoff and soil loss at different ground cover levels from a one-off 55 mil rainfall event. So I guess the table below highlights the really significant differences uh, between the levels of runoff and soil loss, even at, at, a, at a ground cover level that's, that's reasonably high at 69% compared to one with 87%. And you can see there that the significant difference ups 10 times the amount of, uh, of soil loss and 22% uh, and uh, more runoff, just in that small difference in that percentage. So um, that reinforces the need for, for in our higher rainfall districts, uh, closer to the coast of Queensland, east of the Great Divide. But when we talk about ground cover levels, we're, we're typically looking for 90% uh, ground cover levels all year round. So by maintaining those really high levels of ground cover, it's essential for maximising our water infiltration and utilisation by plants and avoiding runoff of water and our precious topsoil with it uh, off the farm, and which ultimately gets into waterways where sediments and nutrients reduce downstream water quality. Uh, some particular soils and land types require special management due to their inherent physical and chemical uh, properties and their position in the landscape. So some of those particular soil constraints we might be familiar with and need to manage for uh, could be salinity, uh, soil erosion and, and sodicity. Sodicity is one that's really important. Uh, a very large percentage of our soils in Queensland are, are 
sodic, either mildly or, or extremely sodic. Um, sodic soils uh, occur where there's an excess of sodium ions leading to, uh, in, the, in, the, in the soil, leading to pore structure and infiltration. Uh, those particular soils are very prone to uh, dispersion or they can dissolve on wetting. And we get uh, significant erosion problems, as you can see in those slides there. So again, in terms of our land and grazing management, uh, prevention is, uh, is certainly the best policy. So by maintaining high levels of ground cover all year round, um, lower utilisation rates uh, and, and longer or more frequent spelling may be required in those at-risk soils. It also means we need to be really careful uh, of those vulnerable and at-risk areas about where we place and establish infrastructure. So uh, fencing, uh, water points, fire lines and tracks, particularly on those erodible and sodic soils. So we minimise any loss of ground surface cover. Uh, we're not exposing those at-risk soils and we're certainly not concentrating water flows. Uh, for areas that may already be affected by erosion or salinity, for you, that may involve uh, planning restoration works, which could include fencing off those scalded or eroded areas, uh, combined with some stabilisation works, increasing the organic matter uh, levels and establishing some permanent perennial vegetation. Uh, the key message there is to look for the signs and act early on any erosion or land degradation issues. Um, this next slide uh, highlights uh, the uh, three gateways model, which has been used to represent a grazing ecosystem. So how efficiently the grazing ecosystem captures sunlight, utilises rainfall and cycles nutrients to grow uh, pasture for your animal's production uh, is largely influenced by our grazing management. And this three gateways model describes the main avenues for influencing animal production through pasture and grazing land management. Uh, for the rest of the talk, we'll concentrate mainly on that land condition gateway, uh, but we also will touch on utilisation rates. So grazing land condition, uh, what is it? So basically, it's the capacity of an area of grazing land to respond to rain and produce useful forage. It's a measure of how well our grazing ecosystem is functioning. Uh, it's made up of three components, pasture condition, soil condition and woodland condition. We've already spent a bit of time on, on the soil, so we'll focus most of the rest of the talk on pasture condition and what makes a healthy pasture. So a healthy pasture uh, has a high percentage and proportion of perennial productive palatable species, commonly known and referred to as 3P uh, grasses. So um, it also has a small number of annuals and small number of pasture weeds. Also, we should be looking in a healthy pasture for a high frequency of desirable forb, so our native and introduced legume species, and a variety of other species for the particular land types we're looking at. But overall, the key thing we're looking for in a pasture and the key determinant of pasture condition and land condition is that proportion and that high proportion of our desirable 3P pasture species. So again, uh, re-emphasising the need for having perennial plants. Uh, they're there for longer. Uh, and they're much more resilient to grazing and climate pressures. Our, our pasture species need to be palatable, so livestock want to readily eat them, and they need to be productive so that our, uh, our animals uh, our, our can consume a, uh, a high quality forage diet and, uh, and heaps of it. So again, why do, uh, why do those desirable three-piece pasture species uh, perform so much better. So they're certainly better at capturing energy. Uh, the uh, solar panels, our leaves and our plant systems, they have much more green leaf for those large perennial tussocks, extensive root systems for storing energy. They're much better at accessing and cycling nutrients in the soil profile, again, with their larger root systems, improve soil organic matter and microbial activity. And again, uh, those large desirable um, 3 p grass species certainly have improved in filtration uh, through the roots and pores, uh, which helps slow runoff, uh, maintain ground cover level and protect our soil surface from exposure to the sun, wind and heat. Uh, here are just some examples 
uh, of some of some pasture species we'd see. So when we're looking at a pasture and doing some assessments, we want to see that very high um, dominance and proportion of our desirable 3P species. So some of those uh, that we refer to as indicator species we'll be looking for might be kangaroo grass, we've got forest bluegrass there on the right hand side at the top, black spear grass at the top on the left, uh, and most of our sown pasture species uh, in, in our grasses and, and also our legumes. Are, are strong indicators of a healthy pasture. Uh, if, if we start to see slight declines in those, we'll see intermediate species such as pitted bluegrass and cooch and others take over. And, and certainly um, our, some of our less desirable species like wire grass are a really good indicator of, uh, of the decline in our, in our pasture and land condition health. Uh, overall, within any particular pasture, we'll see all of those species, but again, emphasising that it's the proportion of our desirable 3P species that's the really critical factor there. So um, DPI, many years ago, developed what they called is the ABCD framework, which is used to classify land condition and provide estimates of potential improvement in your uh, grazing land management system. So that's where land types within a paddock are easily assessed individually relative to their, to their production uh, potential. So land in good condition has the following characteristics. There's a really good coverage of our perennial, uh, palatable and productive three pre-grass species where they'd make up more than 80% of the, of the dry matter yield in that particular pasture. Uh, typically there's few weeds and, and our soil surface condition is, is in really good condition. So it's operating at its full capacity. Uh, land in our B condition is, is similar to a A condition, but there just might be a slight decline in those desirable 3P grasses uh, and an increase in somewhere or other intermediate or less desirable species. But the 3P grasses still make up uh, between 60 to 80% of that dry matter yield. Uh, land in C condition, which is poor or, or starting to show some pronounced forms of decline or degradation. So there's a general decline in the proportion of those th desirable 3P grass species, which means there's an increase in those less favourable species. So uh, in, in this particular uh, case, and we've got um, land in poor condition, uh, the 3P species may only make up between 10 and 60% of the yield. There can be obvious signs of past erosion, or the land is highly susceptible to erosion in its current state. Uh, and lastly, we'll go down to land in decondition. Uh, thankfully, we don't see too many areas uh, in this state, but that's very poor, where there's typically uh, a general lack of any perennial species at all. Uh, and those desirable species may um, certainly don't make up any more than 10% of the yield. Typically, we'll see lots of bare ground, lots of colonisation by uh, woody weeds or, or other species, and, and quite often um, severe erosion is, uh, is present. So the department came up with this rolling ball model, uh, which describes uh, the stability and resilience of our grazing land and the ease with which changes in land condition occur. So uh, we, we talked before about how stable and resilient a land in A condition is. If there's a slight decline to B condition, you can tell by the slope in the conceptual diagram here that it's, it's relatively easy through some subtle management changes to move back to good land condition. But that slippery slope between B and C condition is one we really want to avoid. So C condition is where we've got that marked decline in our, our land and pasture condition. And it's going to take some management effort over a number of years to get back uh, to B condition. And the last drop off there, we really don't want to entertain having land in very poor condition at all. Uh, it uh, requires huge inputs uh, to get it back over a very long period of time. It may not be cost effective, and in some cases, if it's severely degraded, it may not even be able to, to possible to return that back to any sort of a state at all. So the next slide um, really shows how land condition affects pasture growth and highlights the significant impact that land and pasture degradation can have on pasture production and therefore your profitability. With uh, land here uh, for this particular location in A condition, producing twice as much useful forage as our land in C condition. So, in other words, if you if your um, land in good condition, uh, it's key to maintaining sustainable production rates and ensuring your grazing ecosystem is sustainable and resilient. If it's if it's degraded, it's much less productive, 
It's less profitable with lower returns on investment and far less stable to recover uh, after a disturbance. Um, unfortunately, we see these examples uh, of, uh, of different grazing management uh, across most districts where we travel. So again, it just reinforces about the importance of your grazing land management at improving your productivity and profitability at your greater resilience to disturbances and enhanced biodiversity values. So here we have the same land type, same climatic conditions, but some very uh, different long-term grazing management affecting what we see there in the photo. So what are the drivers of land condition? Uh, so some of the key drivers are climate, land and soil types, plant types and, and our grazing management. And again, which of these factors do we have most control over? And that's our long-term grazing management. But the key thing to remember is, is that pasture and land condition is slow to change. That happens over a significant number of years. So um, any short-term disturbances, as can be seen here, due to drought or fire, that have a significant impact on the available forage and ground cover at a particular time. Uh, however, the key point is if that, that pasture and land condition does not change quickly over one or two seasons, some heavy overgrazing or, or one period of dry weather or one particular fire, provided that those desirable 3 p pasture plants uh, have a chance to recover through strategic spelling. So what are some of grazing management tools that we use to maintain our land in good, in good condition? So we can use stocking rates appropriate for the land types and land condition. Uh, we can monitor land and pasture condition annually and undertake regular forage budgeting to adjust stock numbers to seasonal forage availability. We can make sure that our grazing system incorporates routine spelling that allows for our desirable species to rest, recover and set seed. We can time our stock management activities. So, you know, when our when do we join, uh, when we're calving, uh, when we're weaning, when we're selling, uh, match to seasonal variations in pasture quality and quantity. We can use infrastructure to uh, to manage particular land types, manage vulnerable areas, riparian areas, and we also need to think about how we use fire in the landscape, either for protection or undertaking planned burns to improve pasture vigour, composition, and manage weed load. So this particular conceptual uh, graph just highlights the difference between uh, long-term carrying capacity, which is the number of animals that a paddock or a property can support over the longer term based on average climatic conditions, compared to uh, the stocking rate, which again is, uh, needs to be flexible and, uh, and adjusted by forage budgeting, uh, depending on how much feed is available in the season. So we adjust our animals using our stocking rates. That's all about undertaking those forage budgets. Um, so uh, if, you, if you're not already doing it and you haven't attended a, uh, a stock take workshop, there's some really good uh, videos online about forage budgeting uh, that you can access on the Future Beef website. When we're considering uh, that supply of feed and the demand, we not only have to consider our grazing animals, but also pest animals and others that might be utilising that feed. The other key concept we wanted to talk about was safe utilisation rates. So utilisation rate is the maximum rate of our average annual use. So compared to what amount of pasture that's consumed by our animals compared to the amount that's grown, that's consistent with uh, maintaining or encouraging good land condition. So typically uh, across our landscape, that'll vary depending on the land type and the land condition and our goals. But it typically ranges between 25% to 40%. Uh, by weight, that's not height, uh, depending on those factors. So our more, more fertile landscapes that are more resilient, we can afford some high utilisation rates of up to um, 30 to 40 per cent. Uh, and our, our more uh, fragile landscapes or landscapes that are uh, undergoing recovery, we might only want to use 20 to 25 per cent of the pasture that's grown and, uh, and save the rest for the pasture plant and for the soil. Uh, rest at critical times, uh, is really the key. So this this slide highlights our uh, overgrazing uh, and um, particularly in that early growth phase after disturbance when our feed quality might be highest but our feed quantity is lowest. 
uh, can can cause severe uh, impacts on the plant's vigour and growth over the whole season due to those um, consistently depleted energy stores in our roots and damage to growing uh, points. The next slide again reinforces that same one. You know, many people are probably familiar with this particular slide where the photo demonstrates how, how grazing affects the, the growth of pasture plants. So the plant on the right was regularly clipped and you can see the resulting uh, impact on the biomass both above and below the ground. Whereas the, uh, the spear grass plant on the left hand side was clipped a few times in the growing season to mimic uh, moderate grazing pressure. It has a much bigger biomass and just look at that healthy developed root system for accessing nutrients uh, down into the soil profile and think of the organic matter levels under that compared to the plant on the right hand side. So again reinforcing that the amount and timing of rest in our systems is critical for plant health and recovery. A grazing systems, uh, we won't elaborate, we could talk all day in itself on grazing systems. The key thing to remember is whatever grazing system you, you have, depending on your goals, your land types, resources and time, needs to incorp some, incorporate some type of strategic rest or spelling. Uh, and important to note that a, uh, a quite a comprehensive study that was undertaken by CSIRO and DPI on grazing systems found that it wasn't the grazing system itself rather the grazing uh, management within the system that was the key determinant of, uh, of land condition. So uh, yeah, wrapping up, um, a bit of a reflection on some of those key management uh, for land types and soils. So must ensure we understand their land types and soils in our property and their different uh, productive capacity and limitations. That all starts with property mapping and planning. Uh, where we use that information in our management decisions. So what's our long-term safe carrying capacity? How much pasture is going to be utilised? Uh, are we uh, fencing to land types where possible? And where we locate our infrastructure uh, to protect our land and keep it in good condition. So where we locate our fences, water points, feed areas, uh, fire lines, track designs. Um, you also need to note that if these areas are at risk, or, uh, or showing signs of erosion or salinity that they require specific management action and that needs to be acted on early. Uh, we need to maintain high levels of effective ground cover all year round at 90% at, at or above uh, for us down here in South East Queensland and maintain healthy diverse perennial pastures being the key to maintaining organic matter and biological activity in our soils. And if um, if a farming or cropping or growing hay is part of your uh, your system, we for our soil health, we need to regularly soil test and replace those nutrients that have been exported off our farms. In terms of maintaining pasture and land condition, uh, the key to production and resilience is to maintain our land in good condition. So by that we mean implementing those grazing management practices which promote that healthy diverse pastures dominated by those desirable three P species, again with those high levels of ground cover. We do that by regularly assessing uh, and using forage budgeting to adjust stock numbers according to our seasonal forage availability um, and ensuring that our grazing systems incorporate that strategic rest uh, in the growing season to allow our desirable species to recover and set seed. Um, there's a number of management tools, so uh, wire and, uh, and, and fencing and water infrastructure, fire management, pasture improvement, um, managing fragile areas specifically, and controlling uh, priority weeds and pests. In terms of restoring areas, so right now, and, and some timeliness of operations for what we're looking at now. So we're at the end of the growing season, as Damien's referred to, it's an ideal time to assess our pasture and land condition and see how it's either recovered or it's coping with ongoing ground impacts. So by doing those uh, pasture and land condition assessments, it can help identify areas that may require a strategic spell in the next growing season to allow for that recovery and seeding so we can start to plan and prepare for that now in terms of what, what are our selling options, do we hold off on restocking. Uh, that also may identify where pastures that are degraded may benefit from some planned fire um, to improve our pasture composition. That is to decrease some of our undesirable species like wiregrass and other pasture weeds and favour our desirable species 
our three uh, our, our palatable perennial productive species like speargrass, bluegrass and kangaroo grass. It's an ideal time to undertake a dry season forage budget to assess our supply of useful forage in the paddock that's going to safely carry our livestock through to the green our green days in the late spring or early, early summer and allow us to plan to adjust our stock numbers early. Um, we may also consider pasture renovation or improvement of degraded areas, looking at suitable uh, grass and legume species for the particular land type. Um, we need to do a cost benefit on that and, and also acknowledge that the, uh, the grazing management that's allowed the degradation to occur in the, in the first place needs to be, uh, needs to be changed. So um, you know, we need special management required to establish and maintaining pastures because it's quite a costly exercise. And lastly, I guess if we have areas that are eroded or compacted, it's a great time to think about uh, planning and implementing restoration works. So, um, you know, look at those areas that, that may have uh, feed areas or have sacrificed paddocks that may have been affected uh, during the drought time. So that may involve fencing those off, deep ribbing, uh, ripping, um, adding a soil conditioner and organic matter and revegetating with a cover crop and some perennial pasture species. Uh, and, um, and wrapping up, there's some great resources on the Future Beef website. Again, if you haven't um, participated in a stock take workshop, uh, there's some great tools there in terms of forage budgeting, which we need to do at the, at the, at the present time. Uh, a long paddock website in the Queensland Globe and contact ourselves or, or your, your relevant regional NRM group and DAF regarding what local grazing land management initiatives are underway. Uh, thanks very much.